bone becomes brass, sinew turns to dark steel, and gristle flows with gasoline. The hearth in your breast grows cold as bloody fiber becomes analog adamantine and ethereum. Flesh boils away to make stage for insectium polished porcelain. Your body is not yours. Your mind sits within a husk not meant to house you, your humanity, your consciousness. Everyone who loved you is repulsed now. Pins and needles litter your undead nerves. It is the glistening oil which enslaves you. The nature of time will absolve your lasting wounds as it is wont to do. It may be a decade or a century, but eventually that repugnant shade of humanity will be extinguished wholly. What a prideful Phyrexian you'll be then. Body horror is a subgenre of horror that highlights grotesque, psychologically disturbing violations of the human body. It's a noun. Violations in this case refers to dissection, dismemberment, and rapid dimorphism, among other things. There's a visceral fear and discomfort that comes with witnessing these motifs. But, unlike slasher films, which link unruly teens to grisly deaths, Body horror tends to feature the most everyday protagonists. Over the course of the plot, their body is violated in a deeply personal way. The irreversible trauma of these events usually leads to their identity as it existed before the events of the story being abandoned. The protagonist even grows to embrace their new disfigured form. Why would a person lay witness to such atrocities? Body horror appeals to our morbid curiosity. The phenomena of being unable to look away from something which disgusts us for the fascination of the thing. Frankenstein, the fly, and alien all serve as powerful examples. In Plato's Republic, Book 4, Plato recounts the tale of Leontios who, while walking outside the city wall, came across a pile of dead bodies. Leontios turned away from the site with disgust, but his mind lingered at the intrigue of the site. After a few moments, he whipped back around, stormed over to the macabre mound, pulled open his eyes, and shouted, There, confound you. Stare your fill at the beautiful sight. Plato supposed that a part of man's soul sometimes rallies against reason, and allies instead with desire. We find a way to justify our desire with some sense of righteousness. Over 2,000 years later, the streets of Japan are filled with whispers of an exhilarating and shameful new media, an artistic hurricane violently cleaving traditional social normality. Ero Guru, a movement defined by subject matter that shoehorns eroticism with gore, surreal depictions of naked women splitting in twain, a lover dismembering her partner post-coitus. It's easy to write off such art as shock value, but it's important to remember that juxtaposition is everything in art. Dark is not dark, but for the lack of light. Green not green, but for the lack of red. And so on. To position such gruesomeness within a scene of otherwise soft nature or vice versa creates value. A grayscale of emotion. There is also notable parallel between the intimacy of sexual relationships and first degree murder. To take an otherwise arbitrary moment and add incomprehensible horror elicits greater sadness for the life disrupted by such a tragic violation. Eroguro took deep root in Japanese media through the 20th century, and a certain contemporary artist has perhaps exemplified it best. Junji Ito is a Japanese horror manga author, and in October of 2022, joined the cast of artists Magic the Gathering has employed with a secret layer of his own. Having penned some of the most popular horror works of the modern age, such as Tomi and Uzumaki, Ito was a perfect fit for cards like Plague Crafter and Carrion Feeder. 
Junji Ito has a very scratchy style, which creates a hairy, jittery, unsettling feeling in his subjects. The energy is then forced further onto us with uncanny gestures in unnatural poses. These techniques were made part of Magic's history when Ito was invited to interpret one of Magic's most notable characters. His vision merges seamlessly into the universe because, well, horror isn't new to Magic the Gathering. In fact, body horror isn't just at home in Magic. Body horror has a home in Magic. It has its own plane and a unique race, one that seeks to evangelize the entire multiverse, permanently removing sinful flesh from the view of any star in the sky across infinite universes. What does God look like? Sometimes like this. They used to look like this. On Phyrexia, they look like this. And this. This is another one. This is God too. But, as in any religion, there is a king of kings. A god of gods. This is the Phyrexians. The queen among queens, mother of machines, the grand Cenobite. This is Elish Norn. Her Majesty's likeness is here, yielded by the artful hand of Igor Kirluk. Like Athena from Zeus's head, Elish Norn sprung from the world of Mirrodin. It is unknown who or what she was before being a praetor, which means lord in Phyrexian. Her porcelain-like shell is evidence of her pure-bloodedness, however, suggesting she was back grown. The Cenobite is extremely anthropomorphic. Her bone-white ribcage sits open wide, exposing her gritty, moist viscera. Kirluk hasn't represented human musculature, but rather interwoven ribbed tubing seeped in blood. It's as if her body has grown to try and mimic the human body, but diverted in its accuracy. A shallow parroting of nature, making the act all the more sacrilegious. Elongated, titanium-white appendages are stained, mostly around the joints, with crimson. You can see distinct areas where deep red turns to fatty yellow, which is caused when hemoglobin breaks down. This could be dried serous fluid, which the human body produces to help heal open wounds. This would suggest her body is perpetually responding to her flayed open torso. A feckless memory of the host which Elish Norn inhabits. Igor has positioned us to look up at her, making us feel small and enhancing the feeling of greatness. The scene is bright, with natural light pouring in from the left of the frame. The suggested detail of the background alludes to a monumental window, the kind you would find in any cathedral around the world. Low contrast avoids clashing with the intended focus on the subject, but there's enough to see the jagged edges of the orthodoxy's blasphemous halls. Kirluk has even mimicked the shape of stained glass panels faintly behind Norn. Her hands are open and away from her body, displaying her comfort and confidence. One turned up palm is inviting and warm, the other lifted gesturing towards something out of frame. The loose curled fingers and slight upturn in the wrist suggest, again, a display of comfort and seek to soften and invite her looming form. Her posture is upright, chest forward, chin up, with a slight tilt exposing the neck. All of these indicate complete vulnerability. Kirluk is using every available method of communicating Elishnorn's power and poise in a way that speaks to us on a primal level. The most striking feature of her figure, despite these details, remains her broad, symmetrical headpiece. Even more than her red-white palette, this speaks of her privileged position as head of the machine orthodoxy. But why such an odd swooping shape? And why so large? And it covers the entire face save the humanoid mouth, leaving her devoid of identifiability. Her odd design is provocative and alluring, and I have a theory. 
Imagine if you would feeding a machine images. The machine would be able to recognize them, but not the significance or application of them. It could recognize a stop sign and replicate an averaged version, octagonal, red, white shapes aligned in the middle. It could never, not truly, understand the implication of the sign, how it looks, but not the value in respecting it appropriately. Now imagine instead of a sign, a symbol, one of glory and dominance and above all, royalty, a crown. The machine would study, poring over almost endless images of crowns until it deduced its median shape, the ideal silhouette, one that shares all model attributes in its physicality to the universal crown, the one which all thoughts are modeled on. This is Plato's theory of forms. The all-encompassing exactitude of this crown would be the quantum of this crown's perfection. Yet, for a lack of humanity, the function of a crown escapes the machine. The application of the crown serves only to imbue the oppressed with the authority of the wearer. As the godlike position of Elish Norn is the summation of her identity, her otherwise human identity is replaced with a machine's approximation of all crownness. Its size is equal to the perceived and therefore literal matriarchal power she wields among the Phyrexians. Since Elish Norn's inception, she has reigned over the white mana aligned new Phyrexians. I feel it's important to note the old Phyrexians are gone. They were destroyed as the invasion of Dominaria came to a close and Yogmoth was permanently disposed of. Despite this, when the glistening oil was unknowingly spread to Mirrodin by Karn, it held memories of Phyrexia's old god, his world, and their language. Thus, new Phyrexians hold fragmented notions of this late culture. With this would come influences of Dominaria, including disjointed perceptions of the significance of anatomy, religion, and even the shape of a crown. Elish Norn is an anthropomorphic abomination, the embodiment of the uncanny valley, a hellish abstraction of millennia extinct royalty, a lost and nameless race of creatures perverted with disease amalgamated the remnants of their memories into an organic idol. They were desperate to be subjugated. They longed for a god. Elish Norn, I believe, was sired to give them purpose. They wait on her claw and talon. She is Pope. She is the Grand Cenobite. She is Mother of Machines. Igor Kirilluk was the artist for the most imperative representation of Elish Norn. However, she is not Igor's creation. He could not answer the questions I have about Elish Norn's origin and the choices made in her design. We would need to find the person responsible for the inception of the Praetors. In 2011, Scars of Mirrodin was in full swing with Mirrodin Besieged, the penultimate set in the block. In May, the block would come to a close with its final installation, New Phyrexia. Headed by art director Jeremy Jarvis, New Phyrexia would establish the consequences of Mirrodin's losing their war against the Phyrexians. Building this lost world through the art for each card would be dire. New Phyrexia would also shift the Phyrexians' alignment from mostly black to all five colors as the plague of Phyresis spread across the now conquered plain. This was a pivotal moment in the magic world, both in the lore and in the game. Magic's Color Pie would see the introduction of five characters imperative to the story, the game, and players for the rest of time. Jin Gitaxis Core Auger by Eric Deschamps, Shouldred Whispering One by Jana Scrimmer and Johan Voss, Vorin Kleck's Voice of Hunger by Karl Kapinski, Urabrask the Hidden by Brad Rigney, and of course, Elish Norn Grand Cenobite by Igor Kirluk. These are the five Phyrexian Praetors which rule the spheres of Phyrexia, all of their designs conceived by this man, Richard Witters. This would be the man that could satiate our hunger to learn more about the Praetor's form and therefore, their story.
Witters was the lead concept artist from Shadowmoor through Return to Ravnica. He's helped build many of the most beloved worlds and characters in Magic. In 2014, he became pivotal in building the world of Dungeons & Dragons as the art studio lead. Now as the art director for Larian Studios, the publisher of Baldur's Gate 3, Mr. Witters was kind enough to answer a few questions about the design process and how he arrived at his concept for Elish Norn. He told me much of white mana aligned Phyrexia was guided by and built upon work by Wayne Reynolds, another beloved artist in magic. The marching orders were go nuts, Richard said. The art director Jeremy Jarvis didn't provide much in the way of restrictions. The artists guiding the plane's design wanted the Phyrexians to have extreme silhouettes and were given free reign over the shape language. Focusing on the silhouette of characters is how artists ensure a character is visually interesting, memorable, and stand out. Shape language refers to how we subconsciously interpret shapes. Circles are soft, squares are sturdy, and triangles are dangerous. And these would be the two driving forces driving Phyrexian's design. I asked Richard what his initial inspiration was for Elish Norn's design. I wanted to know if he had an aha moment or if he was confident in his direction from the start. He said, The biggest aha moment was creating the over-the-top mantle shape and seeing the combination of how regal but also dehumanized it made Elish Norn. At some point, someone suggested looking at old chipped sinks to study how the iron was exposed underneath. Then he sent me a picture of the sink. This is the picture of the sink. The most vital part of Norn's design is twofold. One, Witters wanted her to have a long, elegant body to exemplify her grace, imagining her moving in long, flowing strides like a runway model. Something interpreted in Kirluk's art. Second, her mantle shape. She keeps her head tilted up, as if all other creatures were not even worth gazing down at. This harkens back to the pose we studied earlier. So, with this tremendous silhouette, where did Norn's head shape come from? I had to know if my tinfoil theory was even remotely close to Witter's intent. He confirmed as I said that masking a character's face disconnects them from the viewer. It prevents you from reading emotion and expressions. They lose the relatable aspects of an otherwise human form. However, he only mentioned the echoings of blades, teeth, and shark fins in terms of the shape. I was a little disappointed, but frankly, it doesn't matter. Art is about what it evokes. We saw how dangerous, unfeeling, and regal Elish Norn was in her original rendition. All of these were noted by Richard in his responses and clearly communicated in the design. After all, I didn't exactly have old sync on my bingo card for this video. But I was humored by Witter's response when I asked why Elish was more anthropomorphic than the other Praetors. He said he imagined giant doors slowly creaking open, painfully slow like nails on a chalkboard. Elish Norn and her entourage stride through the frame from the shadows with an air of pride and rulership. When I imagined that, I knew I needed that graceful stride and body language to achieve it, he concluded. How sick is that? With this grand vision and this desire to combine grace and viciousness in a humanoid form, I wondered what anatomical difficulties there might have been. He essentially told me he trusted himself, but he trusted the artists that would render any final works more. He was passing his concept to some of the most incredible painters in fantasy art. His focus was to surrender the design and a spark to inspire them. He compared it to a songwriter handing their lyrics to a singer. The singer needs to solve some of it in order to own it. I think this is a beautiful insight into the collaborative nature of designing and painting every work in Magic the Gathering. Richard would work out the soul of the idea, but Igor would have to solve parts of the character himself. Make her his own. Like the doctors on Phyrexia, Witters would build a robust shell, 
but Kirluk would have to install the soul. To get the other half of this mystery solved, I would have to speak to Igor about his hand in the matter. But that would have to be another video. I still had so many questions though, and this was my chance to ask a monumental gear in the process of design about my crackpot theories. With my head cannon on overdrive, I was curious what the backstory of Norn was in the head of the man who created her. Who was she? Where did she come from? Well, unfortunately, Richard didn't have much to say about it. He wanted her to be unrelatable, and that means not having a backstory is better for the character. Not having anything to empathize with makes it darker, and we seek to empathize as humans. It connects us. Not having even a shade of humanity almost leaves a pit in your stomach. Elish Norn and her imperious crusade are all there is to it. No daddy issues, no past abuse, nothing about Norn is a victim. She is, as Mr. Witters put it, a sapient, highly intelligent, single-minded predator. An unstoppable, unrelenting machine. A hollow soul, so to speak. And that's that. Elish Norn Grand Cenobite is nothing more than a cold, unpenitent monster. Looking into her made me realize how much I'd like to feel bad for her past, which is a perfect lesson to show art is a mirror. But there's nothing there. She is not deep. She's a void. Frankly, Elish Norn has more in common with a sink than I would have ever thought. I'm, I'm, I'm actually obsessed with this sink. This is, however, the fate of many Mirrodins. The angels, Oriok, goblins, Leonin, Loxodons, and a swath of other diverse and damned species. Their bodies will be dissected, dismembered, and morphed violently and prejudiciously. Not even the most powerful planeswalkers of the Gatewatch were able to fend off the glistening oil. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. Dylan Thomas begs us not to quit. Not to give in. Not to slink into death and darkness. Jace is dead. But he did not go quietly into the night. Nyssa is dead but she did not go quietly into the night. Vraska is dead, but she did not go quietly into the night. Nor Nahiri, nor Luka, and Shao Shao, not ye. Body horror forces us to face the possibility of not being ourselves. We are ripped violently away from the arms of our sanity and lulled into madness. To lose who you love dearest as you watch, powerless to the loom of fate, is a feat not feasible by even the gods. But to lose yourself is a feat which escapes even the depravity of the ninth circle. So I too now implore you, do not go gentle into that good night. I want to leave you with this final insight into the art and design of Magic the Gathering from Richard Witters. He wished to say to you, every concept and idea that comes out of a concept push is a culmination of the input of many artists, writers, and game designers. There are so many conversations, questions, experiments, and suggestions that it becomes very hard to take sole credit for anything. I always loved that part. And though I did really enjoy designing the Praetors, they were built on the foundations the whole team helped lay down. Much like a garage band jamming until you hit a really good riff together. It's a bit of magic that we all helped make. <laughs>